I built and flew a two-stage actively controlled monorocket. Let's talk about it. Diamond X is 65 millimeters in diameter, weighs about one kilo, and uses four tail control surfaces to steer. It has a couple of different guidance modes. The first is Euler Angle Attitude Guidance, where it flies pitch, yaw, and roll profiles. This is actually tested every flight, but it was first flown in Flight Test 1 with this very cool roll program. The second mode is Waypoint Guidance, where it flies to a set of airborne coordinates that I assign via radio data link. This was tested in flight tests 3, 4, and 5. A video for that is up on my channel too. Today we're going to do something that I have not done yet, a two-stage rocket flight with active controls. I know that a lot of you are interested in engineering, math, or programming, but don't know how to grow those skills. Well, lucky you, because today's sponsor Brilliant can help with that. Brilliant is an online learning platform that offers interactive courses in math, programming, AI, and more. Brilliant goes beyond just lectures. Its courses focus on hands-on problem solving that's both more effective and more fun. If you want to learn how to program a flight computer or ground control station, Brilliant's programming courses might be perfect for you. You'll learn the essential coding elements like loops, variables, and nesting, which will get your software projects up and running fast. Their courses are perfect for teaching you how to think in code and turn your ideas into discrete steps and finally into software. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for 30 days completely free and get 20% off your annual subscription, visit brilliant.org slash Lafayette or click the link in the description. This rocket has been iterated through multiple versions over the course of its flights. Block 1 flew in Flight Test 1 and has a pointy tip. It needs to be pointy. Block 2 added this cool nose camera and flew in flights 2, 3, and 4. The nose camera has really cool footage of it leaving silos or flying off rails. And when it's under parachute, the nose camera is typically pointed down, so I get really good views of it descending under parachute. This is the Block 3 version of the rocket. It was designed to use a first stage booster and to fly to even higher altitudes. I've been building this one as a part of a build series on this channel, and today that series ends. Now, I've already flown this airframe once, and it suffered a little bit of damage. This was a single stage shakedown flight that I covered in the Waypoint Guidance video, uh, and this avionics bay had a little parachute-related incident where it fell without parachute from over 2,000 feet. So, step one is to fix that damage and replace all the broken components before we can launch it again. So we're going to take this, which is the shattered remnants of the battery mount from the previous flight. We're going to remove this section of ballast that is just screws and epoxy. So this guy just pops off. Oh no, I broke something else. Uh, and then we're going to take the camera off and install those on our brand new front battery mount. All right, now that we have this guy put together, we need to add our flight battery. And then we're going to remove this damaged section off of the front here and replace it with this one. And Stevie will be watching. Guys, this isn't even my cat. I'm just watching her, but she's such a good little rocketeer. Right, Stevie? High five? Handshake? Nux? Nothing? That's okay. Still a very good kitty. So this video is about booster integration. What does that even mean? Adding a booster to a rocket that doesn't already have one involves a number of different fields. First, let's talk about mechanical design. We want the booster to be really rigidly attached to the upper stage, but still be able to separate cleanly. This booster uses six millimeter carbon fiber rods to do this. Diamond X has a 3D printed fin and motor mount assembly made of carbon fiber reinforced polycarbonate, a very strong and rigid material. For Diamond X Block 3, I added these 6mm channels to the design, which the carbon fiber rods in the booster slide into. This provides mechanical connection and rigidity on 5 of the 6 movement axes, 
The only way that this booster can separate is straight backwards. Second, let's talk about electrical. Originally, I had planned to fly this with a thrust vector controlled booster after using a fixed motor booster to verify sequencing and staging. We'll get to this, but that uh, may or may not be happening anymore. But the vehicle was designed to use this more sophisticated booster and its electrical interface reflects that. The afternoon of the vehicle has this electrical connection that includes lines for a TVC servo power, data, and booster detection. For this fixed motor booster, I only needed the booster detection and ground lines. The booster detection line is connected to a digital input pin on the flight controller with a pull-up resistor, and it's shorted to ground via this connector on the booster. When the booster is connected, the flight computer reads a digital low signal on this line and sends that to the ground control station. This also tells the flight computer if a booster is attached or not, and so it can make informed decisions for its control system based on whether it's got a booster or not. The flight software also needed a little bit of modification. First, we have to add software-driven events for booster separation and upper stage ignition. We also need to modify the data link to pass some booster information to the ground control system. Things like, do we have a booster? Is booster firmware even installed? And if we have a booster, can we detect it? All that stuff obviously needs to be ground tested so we know if it works before we fly. All right, it's loading all of our files. Setting our vents. See our fins moving here. Steve's very concerned about the fins, but that's looking very, very good. We're starting frame rate driven operations. So as you can see here, our flight computer is physically connected to the laptop. So that's how it's pulling this data off via the USB line. So what we're gonna do next is disconnect this and connect our ground telemetry unit. Um, and that way we'll be able to make sure the telemetry radio is working and then we'll start uh, doing things like testing its commands and then testing the booster telemetry functions. You're gonna have to get used to the servos, I'm sorry. They're gonna go off this entire time. You're doing a very good job observing. For anybody who's curious, don't worry, I still have Momo. He's just staying with some family for a while because I have some travel. So I have Stevie for now, but Momo will be back and Stevie is not looking forward to it. We can see that right here we see detect, no detect. So we're gonna take our little uh, connector here and we're just going to nicely place this up like that. This, that should click in place, but it doesn't really need to. We look back over here, we see detect. I'm going to just unplug this and plug it back in a couple times. No detect. Nice. And we'll plug it back in. Detect. So that is the booster. Correction. That is the flight computer detecting the booster via one of these little data lines. So what we're going to do next is we're going to do a number of control tests. Now, if you look at this booster here, it's got some big boy fins on it. Uh, one of the problems with canard control rockets, and I've discussed this in uh, one of the early Diamond X videos, is that imagine these are canards, they would spit off a vortex and that would roll backwards and hit the big fins in the back. Well, with this booster, we have the same problem. So these fins, as they rotate around, are gonna shed a vortex off their tip and also off of this leading edge, and that's gonna impinge on these back fins here. So I don't think I'll be able to control this thing with the booster attached. So what I'm going to do is not try to control it with the booster attached. And then as soon as the booster separates, then the fins will enable and then the rocket will start to guide through the air. So the next thing we're gonna do is something called a pop test. So here is the Block 3 version integrated with two igniters in its rear. So this first igniter is meant to explosively separate off the booster. Then the second igniter it would be placed up inside of the rocket. There's no rocket motor in there now, but up in the rocket motor to ignite it. So we're gonna make sure that these guys go off at the right time, that it doesn't damage any of the flight computer's hardware, uh, and that all of the software flows are correct. So we should expect to see is this guy pop, and then about half a second later, this guy pop. And then I will remove this little plug and then the fin should start to move. And then if I remove this, the fins are working. Look at that. Bam! We're now in recovery mode, and it's pretending like it's descending now. Hey, look at that. I think that worked great. So with everything tested, it's time to fly. Ramsey is bad. 
Boosters off backwards. Yeah. The booster's over here, parachutes out. But... Oh, it's way up there. Yep. Shoots out. Well, I see. I see orange. Straight over here. Yep. These are perfect skies. So, who wants to see the onboard footage? Yeah, so do I. At Apogee, the shock cord snapped and the avionics bay fell, maybe under parachute, and landed somewhere. The evidence here is actually really confusing. Within 30 seconds, the avionics was reporting that it was on the ground safe, but if it fell under parachute, it would have taken much longer than 30 seconds to get to the ground. That leads me to believe that, like in Flight Test 5, when the shock cord snapped, the avionics assembly fell from, this case, about 4,000 feet and then landed somewhere on the ground. Now, it did receive a GPS ping here, which is downwind, but if the avionics bay fell without a parachute, it should have landed basically right underneath wherever the vehicle was at Apogee. It should not probably have drifted with the wind, which leads me to believe that if this ping is correct, it traveled under parachute for a significant distance. The last weird thing is that after about two minutes of getting telemetry from it, during which time I safely turned off the cameras and safe the flight computer, I suddenly stopped receiving packets from the flight computer. I searched these areas in the launch day and then went back to the launch site for two other weekends to try to find the avionics bay. I searched these areas the first weekend and then all of these areas the second. Both time the corn was still pretty tall, so it was a pretty tough search. I was like hunched over in the corn looking left and right, but I couldn't find it. I found a couple other folks' rockets, but no avionics bay, which means it's still out there somewhere. So post-flight analysis is a bit difficult because I don't have the flight data or the onboard footage but we can still learn a lot from the video taken from the ground. First, let's look at the video, zoomed in and centered on the vehicle. Boosters off backwards. The booster's over here, parachute's out. Oh, it's way up there. Yep. Shoots out. Well, I see. Uh, I see orange. Straight over here. Yep. These are perfect skies. Here we can see liftoff and a rapid, sudden pitching. This looks like weather cocking because it pitches directly into the wind. It looks like this rocket was a bit overstable, which matches what Open Rocket would suggest, and it probably needed a little bit more thrust in its booster motor. Next, we can see booster separation, and the vehicle immediately pitches up to this angle of attack. This means the control system has enabled and the vehicle is trying to pitch up in its launch direction hold mode. There's upper stage ignition and the vehicle pitches up to this angle of attack. What I like to see is that for the first few frames where we get a good view, this angle of attack stays pretty constant. A poorly tuned pitch control system would oscillate and this one looks pretty stable from the ground. My model suggested that it should be stable and this video provides a little bit of validation that that model is correct. On top of the flight data I have from previous flights, I believe that my model is quite accurate in pitch dynamics below about Mach 0.8. I don't have data above Mach 0.8, and that's where things get transonic and aerodynamics gets a little wonky. Next you can see the guidance mode change. The camera very unhelpfully loses focus here, but the vehicle drops its angle of attack and starts the slow turn to the right. This is generally in the direction of the waypoint, but I didn't really expect this heading change. I would have expected the vehicle to pitch immediately downrange and then hold a constant heading varying its angle from vertical to try to achieve the waypoint. That may be an effect of a slightly unstable roll during the waypoint guidance mode, but it also could be something else. I don't know. As the vehicle reaches Apogee, a bright orange parachute can be spotted from the ground, but people lose sight of it pretty quickly. I am not sure if the flight computer's Apogee detection function, or the flight computer's Apogee backup timer, or the motor's ejection charge is what set off this parachute, but it looks like it was right on time. I'm not entirely sure what caused the shock cord to tear, but it doesn't look like the vehicle was traveling too fast when that happened. Given that the shock cord snapped, but the main tube did not suffer something called a zipper, it looks like the ejection charge was just a little too punchy and ended up snapping the shock cord at a weak point. This Kevlar was flown on a number of other flights before this, so a section of it may just have weakened over time.
and that's it. After that, the aft part of the sustainer fell straight to the ground, I recovered the booster, and the avionics bay is missing in action. I'll be honest, it's kind of disappointing. I worked really hard on this rocket, and I think it actually worked really well, but I just don't have all the evidence I need to support that fully. There's some really useful flight data on board, and probably the coolest flight footage I've ever taken, and it's out there somewhere, hidden in a ditch or in a tree or in the corn somewhere. If you are at the AMA site in Muncie, Indiana, and you find this thing laying in a field or hanging from a tree, let me know, and I'd be happy to pay you a finder's fee. But for now, that's the end of Diamond X Block 3. So while it's kind of ended on a bummer, I do know that some things worked. Staging and sequencing worked great. The vehicle clearly stabilized and pitched up to vertical, and it looks like it transitioned to waypoint guidance successfully. The mechanical connection between booster and sustainer kept the stages attached well and separated cleanly, and the upper stage motor ignition system worked perfectly. But there were some problems. First of all, I wasn't recording the telemetry packets that I got down. I had to restart my ground control software, which means I lost the data from those last few packets that came in, which may have told me exactly where the rocket was. So I clearly have some things to improve with my ground control software, and then how I designed two-stage rockets entirely. Nevertheless, I have learned a lot over the course of these last six flights. First, I refined my tail control mount design, and I can squeeze aft control surfaces, electrical connections, and booster mechanical interfaces into a really small area. Second, all of that flight data has helped my modeling of vehicle dynamics, and it's now pretty reliable, even up through high subsonic speeds. My telemetry system is more refined, and since this flight, I've implemented a storage and replay system so I can play back flights and analyze data even if I lose a rocket. Diamond X was able to demonstrate both Euler angle control and waypoint guidance at precision levels that I'm really proud of. I have also learned through the various failures during the Diamond X program that I'm very much pushing the limits of what cardboard airframes, 3D printed structural components, and single deploy parachutes can accomplish. If I want to take rocket active control systems higher and faster, I'm going to have to start the most ambitious project I have ever done. I call this project Sapphire. Sapphire is going to be a major leap forward in almost every respect, but it's going to be difficult. It's going to require a new faster flight computer, a composite airframe, an extremely reliable recovery system, and probably hardest of all, a new, extremely precise and compact set of custom actuators at the back of the rocket. A modular central airframe section and custom motor parts will let me fly anything from a 38mm motor up to a 75mm rocket motor, taking me up past Mach 1.5. Now this is absolutely not a project I would feel comfortable undertaking without the significant experience that I gained flying rockets like Diamond and Shock at subsonic speeds. This project is going to take some time, so don't expect to see it flying anytime soon but I will be posting episodes about its progress as we go. Hatchet is also fully built, and I've been working on the control board that lets it steer its infrared-guided camera. My next video is going to be about Hatchet's first flight, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching, everyone.